Hey everyone, I hope y'all are having a great day. Lately, I have consumed some really awesome Asian stories, and by Asian stories, I not only mean like that it features Asian characters, but also that it's written by Asian writers. And in this case, I think they're all created by Asian women, which is really exciting. So if you're looking for something to read or something to watch, I got you covered. First, I want to talk about The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. It is crazy to me that I bought this book out of the bargain price bucket from Barnes & Noble for $4.98. A book this amazing and this acclaimed was only five bucks. You know, that's like an overpriced bubble tea. That is such a deal. I can't get over it. I haven't read any of Lahiri's novels before, but there's one short story in particular that I've studied twice on two different occasions in two different classes. It's a short story called A Temporary Matter, and I first had it assigned for class during my first year of college, and I had it assigned for class again my senior year of college, so. And I really admire Jimbo Lahiri's writing, so I came back home and I finally picked this up off of my shelf after owning it for approximately five years. I still have the receipt inside the book. I bought it June 20th of 2015. So, five years later, I read it. The namesake is about a family over two generations. It starts with an arranged marriage that happens in India. The couple then moves to Boston together, and in Boston they have a son and a daughter. And so the first, maybe like third of the novel, I would say, it's about the parents' generation, and then the rest of the book follows the son. The son is named Gogol, is that? Correct? I don't know. He's named after a Russian writer, and I'll be honest, I'm not that familiar. Is it pronounced Gogol? Gogol? I don't know. I have no idea. That's the name he's given by his parents, and then later he tries to rename himself as Nikhil. But yeah, this is kind of like, I don't know if this is common in literary fiction, but in my not super long experience reading literary fiction, I feel like there's never a plot that can really be summarized as a logline. So I guess you could say that it's about like an Indian American family adjusting to America and like the generational divide between parents and children. You could also say it's about one boy's struggle with his name and his identity in the world that he's been born into slash the world that he wants to live in. So I don't really know how to describe it to be honest, but I can say that The Namesake is the best book I've read in a really, really, really long time. Okay, I'm gonna try to say that again without getting stupidly emotional. Sophia, are you okay? The Namesake is the best book I've read in a very, very long time. I loved this book and I hated this book. There were parts in which I would read this book and I would be so frustrated because I disagreed so much with how the characters were acting or what they believed or how much they hated, you know, being themselves. There's one character in particular who's a romantic interest of Gogol slash Nikhil who is just so infuriating because she really doesn't develop throughout the book at all. And it makes me really angry to see somebody in their adulthood be so like blatantly dissatisfied with who they are. She's always chasing other people's ideas of happiness or other people's ideas of class or sophistication and really she makes it seem like her biggest enemy is being, you know, like the good Indian American girl that her parents wanted her to be. And I think that's a struggle that makes sense and a lot of people experience, you know, when they're in middle school and high school and maybe the beginning of college. But like by the time that you're living as an adult, I feel like that's something that you should have come to terms with. And like it takes Gogol a while and it takes like a really traumatic event, I guess, for him to realize it. But eventually he learns that he develops. So to see one character in particular who just really just stays so static in her acceptance or lack thereof of her identity, I was like, wake up. <laughs> Anywho, that was a tangent. I really loved The Namesake. I loved it so much. It moved me to tears multiple times. I feel like every other chapter there would be something that really struck me or really resonated with me or Jubilee Harry somehow managed to capture this idea or this concept that I always thought was so ethereal. Am I trying to say ethereal or ephemeral? Let me check. I've been out of school for a week and I already have forgotten how to talk. Mm, okay, after looking at both definitions, I feel like I meant neither. I guess like she has this really amazing way of depicting concepts that are so true and also just so hard to really grasp and put into words. She's able to do that through her characters and her story. I really hope that any immigrant, whether you're first generation, second generation, third generation, it doesn't matter, I feel like you could get something very valuable out of reading this. And it does make me wonder that people who don't have, you know, like a personal immigrant experience, it makes me wonder how they view the story and how well they connect to it. Because for me, reading this felt incredibly personal. I felt so connected to it. And I feel like it would be a little bit difficult to feel that way if you don't have some kind of personal 
personal experience that is reflected in the book. But like regardless, this is such an excellent book. I gave it five out of five stars on Goodreads. This book I think was published in like 2001. Actually it says copyright 2003. So yeah, this book has been out for a while. There are so many people who have praised it before I even read it, right? Like it's a New York Times bestseller. It was turned into a film. Jibba Lahiri won the Pulitzer Prize for her short story collection, Interpretive Maladies. There have been countless critics that have, you know, accounted for how accomplished this book is. And you know, maybe it takes time for people to find themselves drawn to a story like this. I've had it on my shelf for five years, you know, and I finally picked it up to read it this year. But no matter how long it takes, I really do hope that everybody eventually finds themselves gravitated towards something that's going to affect them and move them really really just blow them away like this book did for me okay next up we have some more indian american representation with mindy kaling's new netflix show never have i ever never have i ever just came out it's only 10 episodes long season one and each episode is only 30 less than 30 minutes each so if you really wanted to you could binge this show in a day i binged it over two days i netflix partied it with my sweet mates and we watched five episodes one night and five episodes the second night and it takes a while I think for it to find its ground and find its footing. I think the first three to four episodes in particular are like are very cringy in not a super enjoyable way but starting from episode five I think it really skyrockets and it turns into such an entertaining and fun and likable tv show. It's about a fifth 15 year old girl, I think she's 15, named Devi Vishukumar. She has two best friends, Eleanor and Fabiola, and they're navigating sophomore year of high school together. But especially Devi is feeling particularly confused because her dad died really suddenly in the past year and she hasn't come to terms with that trauma yet. I know that premise sounds kind of serious, but it's a comedy. It's really, really funny. The show is created by Mindy Kaling and I want to say her name is Lang Fisher. It really feels like it has Mindy Kaling's like fingerprint on it. The main character is like super zany and wacky and like very impulsive without really ever wanting to take accountability or face the consequences for it, which I think is really similar to Dr. Mindy Lahiri, which was Mindy's character on The Mindy Project. It's super snappy, super fun, it breezes by, it's so entertaining. By the end of season one, you're gonna beg for season two. Like I said, I think it takes a while to really calibrate itself, but then it is just so, so much fun. I know for The Mindy Project, Mindy Kaling got some flack because she only ever gave herself white love interests. And that's still the case, unfortunately, in Never Have I Ever. One of them is half white, half Japanese, Axton Hall Yoshida, but he was originally written as a white character. He was originally just written as Paxton Hall until the actor made it known that he spoke Japanese and Mindy was like, oh, let's change the character to fit your actual ethnicity. But like the intention of the show was again to have a brown girl pursued by multiple white men. So I don't know how I feel about that. But like other than those love interests, I think this entire show is people of color. Oh, there's one white teacher. But like these minor characters like school principals or therapists or friends, boyfriends, cousins boyfriends they're all people of color and I think that's so exciting I really don't think I've seen a cast as diverse as this one I feel like we're seeing so many different types of people in one show I think it's awesome obviously I think it's also great that this is basically Netflix's biggest hit right now and it has a young brown girl as a lead and a black and an East Asian best friend trio I think my favorite actor in the entire show is baby's mom she blows me away. She is so good at her comedic timing and her comedic delivery, but also when she needs to be, she is so good at her emotional and her dramatic scenes. She kills it in every episode and every scene. I'm a big, big fan of Baby's mother, but really everyone does such a great job and it's an excellent show. Everyone's talking about it. You've probably already seen it, if we're being honest, if you have a Netflix account. But if you haven't watched it, I don't know what you're doing. You're really missing out. It's so much fun and it's gonna take you less than five hours. The last Asian story I want to talk about is the new Netflix movie, The Half of It. I think it released May 1st. It's written and directed by Alice Wu. I remember watching the trailer and crying within like the two minutes or whatever that I was playing. I was like, this is amazing. I need to see it. It's about a senior in high school. She's Chinese American named Ellie Chu. She runs this business of writing papers for other people in her class and getting paid for it. And one boy in her class reaches out to her and asks her for her help, not in writing a paper for school, but in writing a letter, a love letter for a girl that he has a crush on named Astor Flores. She agrees to help him whenever this girl because she needs the money. But in reality, she also has a crush on Astro Flores, which makes things 
things a little complicated. I was so excited for this film. The morning of May 1st, I woke up and I watched it in bed, even though I had plans to see it later. And then I watched it for a second time that night with my sweet mates on Netflix party because that's what we had arranged to do. And I just didn't want to wait until the evening. So I watched it in the morning when I woke up, watched it again that night. And I will say I wanted it to be a little bit better. Like, I think I was a little disappointed or a little underwhelmed. I thought that the plot wasn't always super cohesive or super comprehensive. I feel like when they were editing it, they had left scenes on the editing floor because things weren't always piecing together properly, in my opinion. And I felt like it was a little slow for the first, like, three quarters of the film. But other than that, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was such a heartwarming story. I really, really adored Ellie and Paul. I love the actors who played them, Leah and Daniel, I think his name is. This film feels very heartfelt and it feels very personal. I think that's really enjoyable. I think sometimes the characters are a little pretentious in, in like a John Green way where they're talking about like repressed longing in British literature or like Italian artists or great philosophers, stuff like that, where it feels very lofty. And I think if you're not into characters like that, maybe that might be a little bit hard to swallow. But overall, I thought it was a really great film. I thought it was really beautiful. There's one shot that I keep thinking about and it's the shot where Ellie and Aster are in the hot, what is it called? The hot spring. And they both have their heads floating in the water and it's just their heads kind of next to each other in a diagonal. It's like a close-up shot and you see like the steam from the hot springs and you see two of their heads just floating in the water. It is so beautiful. My description makes it sound creepy, but it's so beautiful. It's a really beautiful story. It feels very emotional. It feels very much like the creators put love into it. I will say the trailer makes you think that plot events occur earlier in the story than they actually do. So I think that's what made it feel slow for me was that I was waiting for these reveals that I already knew from the trailer to happen and they actually happened so late in the film. This past semester my advanced screenwriting professor would sometimes critique our ideas by saying what you think is the climax should actually be the end of act one breaking into act two and I almost feel like I would want to give that advice to this movie. What ended up being the main conflict should have been brought up earlier I think and then consequently the story would have flowed differently and I think a little bit more deeply but I do think the way it exists it's still really beautiful it's still really moving. How often do you get to see American films with a Chinese American lesbian lead. You know, I'll I'll wait if you want to list them, but you know, I feel like you'd come up with very few. So yes, the namesake, never have I ever, the half of it, they're all excellent, excellent stories written, created by Asian women, starring Asian women and other diverse characters, and they're all so excellent. Nothing for me beats the namesake. This is top tier literature. I don't care if I sound basic for saying that because it is the truth. There's just been so much great content coming out lately, which is super exciting because it's like, it's not like we have anything else to do right now. Yes, if you've read The Namesake or if you've watched Never Have I Ever or the half of it, please let me know your thoughts on it. And if you haven't read or watched them, add it to your list. What are you doing right now? May I suggest the things I just talked about? Okay, thanks so much for watching. I hope y'all have a fantastic day and happy reading. Bye! Bye.